Welcome to the Relationship Series Podcast. My name is Uncas Jane, and each episode I'll be speaking to a different state of mind expert on the subject of relationships. Enjoy. Welcome to episode 43 of the Relationship Series. This episode, I'm joined by Alison Chan Lung. Alison uh, is a relationship coach and has been since 2003 and has run the Soulmate Relationship Program for single people who want to meet their life partner and have a loving relationship. Uh, Alison has been a listener of the show, so it's great to have another listener turned into a, a, a speaker. She is now a, a state of mind expert, as everyone else is on my show, um, although previously has worked as an intuitive. And what I'm really interested and excited about talking about today with Alison is um, find uh, how people can find love later in life um, or finding love second time around or after a breakup, as that's an area that Alison tends to work a lot with with her clients. So welcome, Alison. Well, thank you, Ankush. Thank you very much for your introduction. We've known each other for, for a little while online um, as, we, as we, I guess, we're in the same profession and, and move in, in similar circles. But for people that really don't know anything about you, and, and I'm guessing there'll be a lot of people who will be new to you, could you just give a little bit of background, who you are, how did you get into this line of work, um, and, and just anything that might might be relevant. Yes, of course. Well, I came from a psychic background. I actually worked as a psychic consultant many years ago. And it was while I was working as a psychic that I got lots of people coming to me asking about relationships. And a little bit later on, I actually did... Um, a spiritual life coaching course. And I became really, really interested in coaching and how I could help my clients further. And it still seemed to be very much in the area of love and relationships. That that seemed to be the really big area for people coming to me. Um, and then since then, I have become very, very interested in state of mind and how that will also give people um more of an understanding when they're actually dating or when they're going into relationships that's a really different background to to many of the people we've had on the show i know many of them have been therapists and psychologists what what kind of brought you into this into this direction you know was it just that you wanted to help people further or was this was there something else yeah i suppose i've always worked in a, a very intuitive way and i and I do understand that for some people that 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 might seem quite woo woo. Uh, for some people that that can seem like a really great thing. Um, and yeah, I suppose I became very interested in um, Chinese astrology and also feng shui. I'm half Chinese. On the Irish side, there was quite a a lot of sort of interest in, in psychic things and mysticism. So the combination of the two sort of brought me to that. And then it developed really into my love of coaching. I suppose it was really just a way of reaching people and helping people. And I know you work with an awful lot of people. You were We were speaking the other day and you were telling me that, you know, it, there, there's just so many people that you've helped. And, and I know a lot of your practice has, has come through referral and, and word of mouth, which I, I think that really shows that obviously you're you're doing something right and helping people. Um, so so excited to to kind of pick your brain a little bit on on this interview. Um, and and you're you you'd been married and divorced yourself, um, and uh, and and is that partly why you you maybe end up working in specifically with people or quite a lot with people who who've kind of gone through that experience and then found love again. Yeah, I mean, it's funny how 
these things happen really. I suppose having gone through that experience, I have some understanding of it. And then also um, trying online dating myself in my in my mid forties, completely new experience, and meeting my partner when I was forty five. So I suppose I have maybe some understanding, some empathy with people who come to me and say, "What do I do? How do I get back?" In the dating, you know, in, in dating, how do I how do I start? What do I do? So, yeah, it, it's probably drawn people towards me because I've had that experience myself. I assume a lot of people would would feel a little bit out of their depth and maybe a little bit confused and lost, and you know, things have changed, things have moved on. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I think. What people are saying to me, especially if they're in maybe even late 30s onwards, you know, they're just not meeting um, people. You know, they're not socialising as much or if they are socialising, they're they're not meeting um, the sort of people that, that they feel they would like to be in a relationship with. So I suppose that's where online dating has really grown and taken over. But people are also, I think, maybe a little bit resistant to it still who are maybe may people in their 40s and 50s, even though, interestingly enough, I was watching um, First Dates on television the other night, which I love that programme. It's all about people meeting um, for the first time. And there was a lady on there, and she was eight. I think she was 82. <laughs> and she said she'd actually tried online dating. <laughs> And I thought, gosh, isn't that interesting that, that she'd actually given it a go. It hadn't actually worked for her, and that's why she was on the show, but she'd, she'd tried it. So I think a lot, of, a lot of it is just fear of trying something new. What sort of things do you help your, your clients with them? You know, they, they are new to or back on the single scene. You know, maybe they've, they've been in love or married, divorced, or, or split up in a relationship. And, and what are sort of things that you tend to help them with, and what do you... What do you share with them? I think it's partly helping them to overcome their fears. I notice that when people come to me, they have they often have a lot of thinking about what's gone wrong for them. Is there something wrong with them? Why haven't they met someone? Also, sometimes thinking, well, I won't be happy until I, I've met this person. So there's they're often quite caught up in their heads, which I think is probably um, part of their, if you like, their 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 sort of wondering if, if if why it hasn't happened for them, or it happened before and it went wrong. And and how can people get over that? Because I'm sure a lot of people would think, well, that's quite a natural response. I think maybe that that's partly what, what I help them with is to just let them know that that's probably very normal, very natural part of being human, you know, that when something doesn't work out, we look at it and we wonder why and we then we then maybe think something's wrong with us. So, yeah, I think it's partly helping them to see also how their state of mind affects the way they're looking at dating. Um, and how they can actually see see themselves as just being, um, possibly trying something new. This is something very new for them. So could you say more about that? So, so how would state of mind help people? Once they see that there isn't anything wrong with them, I think maybe that's the first starting point. Um, and that they can relax. They can just actually relax into the fact that there's nothing wrong with them. There's actually something new that they can try. There's something new they can discover. I remember I had one guy come to me, and the idea of going to a dating event was there at the back of his mind, because he had mentioned it to me, he would like to try going to a dating event. But he had so much fear around it. You know, what if I go there and I don't meet anyone or nobody talks to me? Just all quite 
quite sort of, you know, normal worries and fears. Um, and I just really helped him to see that that everyone else is probably in the same boat when they when they go to the dating event. But everybody is also quite um, understanding that they're there to meet someone and and just chat and and get to know people. And he actually went ahead. He had quite a lot of fear around it, and that was where he met his wife, his wife to be. So it worked for him in that he could see that when he was in a low mood, yes, he would see all the obstacles, all the reasons why he shouldn't go. But as soon as he was able to just relax, let go of his thinking around it, he went and he really enjoyed it. I think I think you've, you've hit on a couple of really big points there. And, and um I don't want to skip over them because I think they were really important. Uh, the first one, and I wrote both these down as you were talking, the first one was that the first step is realising there's nothing wrong with you. And I think that's a, such a huge statement and it's so easy just to kind of skip past that. But I hadn't really even considered that. But but actually, now that you say it, I can imagine that being, you, you know, a thought in the back of people's mind that, well, my last relationship didn't work out. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Um, and and people can, I'm assuming, be quite self-reflective and, and get really up in their heads. And I think you're right. And, and there seems to be so much pressure, both on men and women, um, uh, I mean, at least I can speak from from the UK. I know people listen to this all around the world. I'm sure it's it's similar, but th- there seems to be so much pressure on men and women to be a certain way. And, um, it, you know, we're, we're constantly bombarded with, you know, advice and magazines and, and all the rest of it. And I was watching this thing, a trailer for a film, um, an Australian film, the other day on Facebook and it was about body image and this lady and I don't know if it's true or not but she's the one of the things in the trailer was that 90% of women hate their bodies and you know I, I watched that and I thought you know what it's not just women I think it, it plays into um everyone's got their own flavor of that and I know, and I'll just speak for myself. I know when I was when I was dating, um, and and looking for someone, you know, I did put, uh, you know, many years ago, I put a lot of emphasis on myself of, you know, trying to appear the best and um, trying to hide what I thought were my faults, and uh, because I guess I never really thought about it, but I guess I did think, you know, maybe not that there was something wrong with me, but although I did have that thought from time to time, but, you know, I wasn't perfect and there was this standard to strive for that I needed to be, you know, a, a certain thing. And actually f- for me, when I, when I dropped that and, and I met my, um, well, probably when by the time this is released will be my wife. I, I met her, you know, after I started coaching, after I started doing this work and I kind of dropped a lot of that. And um, I find that, I found that when I, when I dropped that, all of my interactions changed. And uh, because I, th- I don't know if you, if you find this, that a lot of people walk around with um, like a like a mask, you know, or like this is who I really am. But I don't want to show that because if you don't like that, then uh, then that's really going to hurt me. But so I'll, I'll kind of portray this image and you've got two people certainly at dating events you know you see people like they're portraying their this their dating self and the other person's portraying their dating self and the, and there isn't a connection yeah it's so true i mean i probably heard every single thing that's wrong with any person on this earth you know it could be age i'm too old or like you say around body image i'm too fat or even i'm too thin or yeah i mean it's amazing isn't it how we can find all these things. I, I always sort of think of them as a bit like sticks that we use to beat ourselves up with, beat ourselves over the head with. And, and I've done it myself, you know, um, 
when I was on the dating site, I actually turned 45. My, I had my birthday. And at that time, it seemed like there was a bit of a cutoff point on, on this particular site. You know, when you turn sort of 45, it, it felt like you then went into another box of age. And I suddenly thought, oh. and for a moment, I actually thought, oh, my goodness, you know, I've left it too late. And so I can see how easy it is to get caught up in that, even though I don't actually have a problem with age. But for a moment, I got sucked into it as well, because there was a box and I was now going in the box that would be 45 to 55 rather than I'd been in the box that was, I don't know, 35 to 44. <laughs> so, yeah. And the thing about women and, and um, hating their bodies, I mean, that is a big one. I do get a lot of clients that have got so caught up in that. You know, I can't actually date until I've lost the weight or... Um, I can't wear the clothes that I would like to wear and, and going on a date can just, just contain so many different, you know, elements of that. One of the things that I hadn't recognised a few years ago was that the thing that would really put someone off about me would be the exact same thing that someone else would absolutely love about me. And, and I, you know, that's not just even in romantic relationships. You see that in your friendships. Um, you know, oh, I love so and so. They're really, you know, organized. So it's really easy for me to meet them and, you know, plan things and whatever. And it's like, oh, someone else would be like, oh, they're too organized. They're so boring, right? It's like it's it's not the person. And I and I think it's you know, if someone's coming out of a relationship and listening to this, you know, the thing that your ex didn't like about you could be the exact same thing that someone really admires about you. And you know, there. Are, billions of people on this planet um and uh you know you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea i was going to say that's so true isn't it <clears throat> not everyone is going to like you or be attracted to you but we all have something don't we i i, I always think it's part of our true self that people will be drawn to if we can just allow that to shine through. And as you say, it may even be the thing that we're really trying to disguise or we're really trying to move away from that actually they really like about us. I, I wanted to kind of <clears throat> reveal maybe a little bit behind the male psyche as well when it when it when it comes to um because because I hear a lot of people talk about body image. It's just something that's kind of come up. Like I said, I, I saw this trailer and um I was with a bunch of guys um, a few weeks ago. I was running an event um, around state of mind and but for men. And um, as always, when you get a bunch of men together, the conversation will eventually turn to women. It's what men do. And what was really interesting, and you know, some of the people were single, some of the people weren't. But what was really interesting was what what came out was the kind of woman that one man found really, really attractive was completely the opposite of, of someone else. And, and I mean, completely the opposite. So where one man would have thought, oh, she's beautiful, the other man would have said, oh, she's far too skinny for me. Whereas someone else would say, oh, that woman's beautiful. She's far too big for me. So, you know, when it comes to any any size shape height uh age you know that there is you know it, it's uh like you say you you might you might have thought oh for a second i'm i'm too i've left it too late but for some people you know that, that oh, i don't want to date someone that young you know i can't relate to them and we for, i think we are we often forget that and and that kind of comes to the second point i wanted to bring up that you that you hit on which i thought was so powerful so um really hits the nail on the head which is it wasn't the fact that you're getting pe in my this is my opinion so please correct me if i'm putting words in your mouth but it, it it wasn't the fact that you're getting your clients to go and try different experiences and go on dating sites and go to dating events because i'm sure there are people that go to those sites and go to those events who don't find someone what you said was it's about your state of mind 
And I think that's so important. And I didn't want to skip over that because I think with anything, if if uh, if you approach it with you know fun, lightheartedness, just just to sit, kind of see what happens without any, any expectations, it's going to be such a different um, experience than taking it really seriously and <clears throat> making it really mean something. Yes, I sometimes think um, when I'm working with clients, actually, maybe I should change the name of the program. You know, it's called the Soulmate Relationship Program, but maybe it's um, more of a relax and enjoy yourself program. You know, the more the more you can enjoy actually being single as well and the benefits of being single um, and enjoy meeting new people. Like you say, without any expectation, the more you can relax and enjoy those, um, even going to a dating event, just, in, just enjoy the experience of it, whether it leads anywhere, whether it doesn't. And go in that state of mind um, just seems to it seems to work. And I noticed that when I went on dates, if I had a lot on my mind, if I had a lot of thinking about it, or even about any something else, it just didn't work for me. And I noticed that happens with my clients as well. If they're going on a date and they've got their big checklist, or they've got a huge amount of expectation about what the date should be like they come away and they they it hasn't worked for them so state of mind seems incredibly powerful and it seems like the attitude it's almost like the attitude that we have when we go into something so what would you say to someone who's listening to this and is thinking okay i, I get it alison but <laughs> They struggle to change that, so they so they can't help themselves. They go, yeah, but when I go on a date, I I feel really nervous, or when I go to these events, I can't help it. Yeah. What what advice would you give to someone like like that? Yeah, and I think maybe it's not about changing it. Maybe it's about yeah, it, it's okay to get nervous. And almost what I find is when my client realizes that or. When they see, oh, yes, actually, it's okay to get nervous. It's okay to be um, a little bit unsure of, of, of themselves. That they, it's almost like then they do relax. It's almost like they, then they, they're able to drop that thinking because they're not making it, again, something that's wrong, something that's wrong with them, something that's, that's not right. They're just going, oh, yes. And it's part of the human experience. It's part of being human that we get nervous. I got a little bit nervous before doing this today, you know. And it's there's something, isn't there, very close in the physiology of being nervous and being excited. They're very, they're very close in what happens, I believe, in the body. So some people will get really excited um, about something, and that that might have the same sort of feel to it, but. Again, it's quite normal to get excited. It's quite normal to get a little bit nervous. And I think once they see that, it helps them to just just get get a bit quieter, get a bit calmer. Tell us some of the... You told us about one guy who went to a dating event and met his wife. I mean, you work with a lot of people. Tell us some of the you know transformations that have occurred because it sounds so simple. <laughs> Maybe it is more simple than we think. I've often thought that I've complicated things and made them more difficult. And I think maybe it is more simple. I mean, another example was a client who really wasn't having much success with, with online dating. She did, really didn't enjoy it that much. Um, it wasn't fun for her. Who then went on holiday and was in such a relaxed state of mind that she actually met her husband on holiday. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting that everyone has to go on holiday to meet their partner, but it was when she just stopped thinking about it, actually, that it happened for her. 
maybe she was putting a lot of pressure on herself with the online dating. I think that's a key word is, is pressure. And uh, I think we spoke about this the other day that I was actually uh, many years ago thinking about doing an event. I, I did it in the end, which it didn't, it wasn't very successful. I was just starting out, but uh, doing an event for, for women with a, with a female colleague of mine around this very subject of um, of pressure, because you're right. And, and it's true, by the way, it's tr as true for men as it is for women, that that if we put pressure on ourselves, and actually, I don't think this is just with dating. I think this is you could you could say the same thing around putting pressure on yourself to have your marriage be a certain way, or put pressure on a friendship, or put pressure on so many things. It almost kind of makes it more difficult for that to come to fruition. And I find that you know, I guess not not so many years ago when I was dating, sometimes. And I think people are generally quite, and you know, you talked about intuition. I think people are generally quite intuitive. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of talk. <clears throat> there's a lot of talk about presence in relationship and people being present. And I think the same is true for dating. And if you're with someone and actually they've got a whole lot going on in their head about, you know, they've got a mental checklist. Are you the right one? You know, do you match my criteria and this, this, and, and they're not actually present with you and enjoying your company, then it's it's difficult for them to connect with you, even though you might be a wonderful person and, and vice versa. Do, do you see things in that way as well? Definitely, definitely. I saw, I, I saw it actually on First Dates. There was another episode and um, it's a bit like you, you get to see people on a date and there was someone on there and talking about their ex and obviously, still had a lot of thinking around their ex and around the past and I think that's another thing that clients come to me with they, they, they feel they've got a lot of baggage or they feel that they're still thinking about the past a lot and that stops them I think from being present probably on a date or even with with their friends you know sometimes they say to me, my my friends are, are, are fed up with me talking about my ex or the past and that's why I've come to you because I I need to I need to um, move on from this so, so how do people move on you know do they do they require deep therapeutic type of work or you know um, what, what's needed for people because I'm, I'm sure there are people out there and there might be some who are listening to this that feel that they they have had a difficult or traumatic experience or they're still unhappy about things that have happened in the past and they're struggling to move forward. Yeah. I mean, even, even just yesterday, a client was talking about their childhood and, oh, I'm sure this has had an effect on me. I think the way they move past it, what I've come to see over the years is it's their own insight. It's, it's, it's a, their own wisdom, their own intuition, their own gut feelings. So something will pop into their head, something will pop up for them. And that is probably the most powerful way that I've seen transformation happen in a shift. It was almost like yesterday when she was talking about, oh, I think it's my childhood. And it was almost like I said to her, well, what if that, what if you were able to just put that to one side? almost forget about that and she said yeah you know it was like she suddenly had her own insight around it but of course while she's thinking about that and caught up in that she could be talking to the most wonderful man in the world but she's not actually there with him <laughs> She's still thinking about what happened in her childhood. And I, I said to her, that's where we have free will. We have a choice to think about that or to decide not to, to kind of forget the past. I think that was something that Sydney Banks said, that we have a choice. And this isn't about just, I guess, 
ignoring things or, or, or putting things in a little box and forgetting about it because people would say well, that that's probably quite psychologically unhealthy. Yeah, even though people might also say that it could be quite psychologically unhealthy to spend a lot of time in therapy going over the path. How painful is that? And that the past is actually just, it's a memory, isn't it, made up of thoughts. Um, and I suppose one of the things that comes up in sessions is how, how many thoughts we have in a day. You know, we have so many thoughts. I think it's something like 90,000 thoughts, 60,000 to 90,000 thoughts. But we don't have to act on them. We don't have to, to even dwell on them. It's not, it's not denying them because we can't stop thinking and we can't control what thoughts are coming in. But through our free will, we can choose. We can choose what, what we want, to, how, I suppose, yeah, we can choose how we want to be in any given situation. Would, would you say that, because that's quite a big statement, we can choose how to be in any given situation. I know for me, sometimes it doesn't feel like that. But we have that, we still have that choice. We still have that choice. Um, and that came up for me, funnily enough, um, last year, I was going through a lot of teeth stuff. Now, most people don't like going to the dentist and I had a lot of um, dental stuff that I was having to deal with. And I had a lot of fear around it, Ankush. I, it brought up all my fears and resistance because I'd gone through quite a lot of dental work before. And this time it was actually around that I was going to be losing some teeth. And, and this is where I really got an understanding of how thought creates our feelings because I thought my feelings were coming from having to go through this really horrible experience of losing some teeth and, and just all the sort of stuff you don't want to go through around the dentist. But I had this sudden sort of insight and realisation that my feelings actually weren't coming from the teeth. They weren't even coming from losing the teeth. They were coming from my thinking because I had so much thinking about how it should be, what it should be like, how I should be like, why is this happening to me? And... Um, a shift occurred and actually I, I had to go and I had to get these new teeth and I came back and, and they were quite right. And even my partner was saying to me, those, they, they don't look right, those teeth. And, and I laughed and I said, you know, I look a bit like that horse. I don't know if you've ever heard of that program, Mr. Ed, the talking horse. He has like these buck teeth. <laughs> they're like really big and they're sticking out. And the fact that I could laugh about it, and then my partner sent me a picture of Mr. Ed, and I just laughed before I would have been so upset and so offended. How could you send that to me when I'm going through this terrible time with my teeth? And, and I actually posted it on Facebook. I don't know if anyone knew what it was about, but I just laughed and the shift just occurred. You know, it wasn't such a big deal. I made the choice then to see it in a different way because I understood that my feelings weren't coming from the teeth or the loss of the teeth. My feeling was coming from my thinking. My upset feeling was coming from my upset thinking. And to bring that back to relationship, um, I, I know that's the key teaching, if you like, of, of all the state of mind experts that we've had on the show is you know applying to relationships that so often whether it's dating or relationships it can look like our feelings are telling us about the other person or the situation we're in with the other person but i know um i'm, I'm sure for you as, as it has been for me that it was a game changer when i saw that our i psych our psychology just doesn't work that way Yes, and I think that's what I've been able to now. I, it, that was the missing link for me. And now I'm being able to 
help my clients to maybe just get a glimpse of that or to see some of that. And I've noticed they've started having their own insights around that when they've seen that it wasn't to do with the other person or it wasn't, it's not to do with their past or it's not to do that it's something wrong with them. And and how has this impacted your own relationship? I mean, um, I'm I'm sure there must be some some stories or some examples that you must have of of your own life. Yeah, I think it's been huge. I mean, even around that story of the teeth, you know, it was like before if if um, my partner Greg had sent me a, you know, I was the one that mentioned the horse, but if he had sent me that picture before, I would have been so like, oh, how could you do that? And you know, now we can be having maybe, you know, I noticed that we get into maybe a little bit of an argument, but it's, it's almost as though we just don't carry it on anymore. We just don't get caught up in it anymore. I, I think that's because I start to see, oh, I'm blaming him, but actually it's not, it's not anything to do with him. It's so easy to do that, isn't it, to blame something. This is what's causing my upset feeling. You, you're causing it, or my teeth, or whatever it is. And then I can just sort of go, oh, no, no, it's not. So it's a much more peaceful, much more peaceful place to be. And I, what I find and what I'm hearing is that, you know, we move the focus away from the other person onto ourselves. So rather than being upset at your partner for sending the photo, the focus comes back on you. And maybe that's what I mean about we have a a choice. It might not feel like it at the time. I mean, I definitely couldn't see that around the the whole teeth episode. And I'm sure there's been other episodes, you know, probably something trivial as well. You know, like he likes to have the lights all on and I like to have dim lighting, you know, or whatever it is. It could be something really, really silly. Um, But it might lead to wanting to change that person or maybe even wanting to change the way I was around the teeth. But once I could see it much more clearly, I didn't need to change anything about it. I was still going to have to go through that experience, but I could just go through it in a different way. I've asked this to, to other people on other episodes, but I'll ask it again because this might be the first episode someone's listened to. Where, where does that leave you in terms of, I guess, being a pushover or just making do or, you know, do, do you just live in the land of compromise or, you know, or, or how does that work out for you then? Because people might think that this is really a passive way to go through life. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I don't think it's about that, but I think what it is, what I've realised is that when I'm in a very reactive state, when I'm upset, if I try to speak to the person in that state, it's never going to go very well. Whereas when I can see things more clearly, I'm in a... I've got a a quieter mind, I haven't got all that thinking around it, then I can still have a conversation with someone. And that conversation's going to go much better. So if there's something I don't like, I can speak about it from that place, but it's going to go much better because it's calmer and I'm not reacting, you know? Yeah, and and it's so true. And, you know, we've been speaking for, for just over 40 minutes about, you know, relationships and finding love again and and actually I think everything that we've spoken about applies to so many different relationships you know if you're if you've got a I was talking to a client the other day who was struggling with a business colleague and I think it's exactly the same thing like you said if when you're upset with them you're not going to be very effective in communicating what you want to communicate as opposed to you know being in a clearer headspace, um, you can come across firmly, but be far more productive and have it more likely the other person's going to listen to you. Yeah. Yeah, and I think our basic, um, or if you like, our, our nature is to be loving and understanding. But of course, when I'm upset, and probably the same like you're saying about about this person, when they're upset with someone, our defences come up and 
we say things that we don't we don't you know we regret later on again you 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 drop in some really big statements there Alison. so you you said our, our nature is to be our very nature is to be loving and understanding i think is that what you said and you know that just reminded me i was talking to a friend of mine and we've got a mutual friend and i i'm i'm kind of less close to him if you like than, than my other friend is and we were we were talking about him and what was really interesting was that that guy um, had a completely different impression and experience of him than me. And his experience and impression of him was X, you know, it was negative and, um, you know, certain character flaws and all the rest of it. And, and I've become closer to this person recently. And, and I found it, him to be a, a really really great person and that doesn't mean oh i'm i'm somehow better or bring out the best in him but what i what i thought about was it's really interesting because i'm sure the opposite of that happens and no matter how bad the person looks to my friend actually his uh the way he is, he also shows, you know, like that, like a very nice, genuine personality. And so that, you know, again, it's such a huge statement, but I think what you're pointing to is everyone's got that capacity within them. And even the worst person on the world at some point shows, shows love and understanding. Yes. Yeah. It is a big statement. It is a big statement, but that's what I've seen to be true in people well well we it's a big statement and one that we're going to have to to leave on because we've run out of time if, if people want to connect with you if they want to find out more what's the best way for them to do that they can do that through my website which is www.alisonchanlung.com and they can contact me through there and it gives my my numbers and my my email on there or they can contact me on Facebook. And again, Alison Chandler on Facebook. Fantastic. I, I will be publishing this on Facebook, so I will tag you in that post. Um, and I'll put your website up on in, in the description on, on YouTube. If you listen to this on iTunes, you can uh, type it in and, and, and find Alison. Um, as usual, people can find out more about me and find all the previous episodes on this show via my website, which is uncushjane.com www.uncushjane.co.uk A-N-K-U-S-H-J-A-I-N Just click on uh, blog and you'll find all the latest and previous episodes with links to Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube. Um, there's also a contact me. So if anyone's got any questions for Alison or any of the previous shows or if you've got a question for me or would, would like to connect, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for being on the show, Alison. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you, Ankush. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me on your show. And I love your show, so I should be listening to all your new episodes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, and I will see the next listeners next time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Relationship Series podcast. If you want to hear more, you can click the subscribe button below. You can share this and impact someone else who can benefit, or you can like it and encourage others to listen. Also, it'd be great if you leave me a comment below as I always love hearing from listeners and I want to keep creating great content for you. Thanks for listening.